the sacrament of the Eucharist. Yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who hath made the blood of martyrs the seed of Christians, mercifully grant that the field which your church, watered by the blood shed by St. Charles Luanga and his companions, may be fertile and always yield you an abundant harvest. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, let's uh, kind of recap where we are, get our sense of context, and then we're going to jump right back in. Um, today's pretty heavy, uh, believe it or not. I had the first class in Highlands yesterday, and um, but it's I think it's absolutely fundamental for us to understand the Eucharist. But just context. Um, remember the Catechism? And we're using the compendium, the Catechism, which is like one fourth the size of the Catechism. Uh, basically says what we believe, you can accuse the church of a lot of things. One thing you can't accuse us of is like hiding what we believe. It's, it's free online, okay? Just go to the catechism, go to the Bible. Uh, it's right there. And if a priest or a bishop or anybody were to say something contrary uh, to what the church officially teaches, they are what's called a heretic, okay? They are the ones who are wrong. Who are wrong. And so it's very simple you know, what the rules are um, and what we believe. Catechism broken up into four sections. And we got through the first section last year. We are halfway, no, third of the way through the second section. Uh, and so the first section is the content of what we believe. Remember, Christ came to proclaim the truth. He's the fullness of truth. He's the word of God. And early in the Gospels, um, I'm thinking... In the early chapters of Mark, uh, he's in Capernaum. He wants to go to other towns and villages and cities. This is the Lord. And they're, trying, they're pressing him, oh, stay with us. He says, no, this is why I came, to proclaim the truth. Lord, I thought you came to die on the cross. Well, I, that's the climactic part of his ministry, obviously. But that early part is proclamation of the truth. And that's important because... You can't have a relationship with someone and you can't love somebody unless you know something about them. Love always follows knowledge. And so first things first, uh, what did Christ come to reveal? Ultimately, it's about himself. It's not, a, it's not like a, a set of uh, weird teachings. He didn't come to teach us long division. He came to reveal ultimately himself. He was the perfect image of the Father. He's the word of God himself, and so he reveals himself, as opposed to other founders of other religions who are like, oh, by the way, God told me this. Go look at, you know, this. No, Christ says, look at me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so that first section of the Catechism, which is summarized by the Creed, um, even though those are 12 short articles, you can unpack those and really get into the content of what we believe. And hopefully you come to a knowledge of Christ through that. Now, it's amazing. Even to have secular people, they talk about if they converted to the faith, or even if they're, they're still sort of, they're flirting with it. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of the actors who played in Scorsese's movie Silence around 19, uh, 2016. Um, they are secular, um, and, uh, but nonetheless, they had to uh, take, go on a, an Ignatian retreat because they were to act as, uh, as Jesuit missionaries. And so they did a five-day silent retreat. And it was amazing um, reading the article of um, the one, I forget the actor's name, um, but he's eth ethnically Jewish, but secular, completely secular. And it didn't seem like he was trying to make a, you know, plug, a plug to get Christians to come see the movie. It, it seemed authentic. He, he was very intrigued by the person of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what happens. When people encounter Christ in the Gospels, he's a very, very intriguing individual. If you just read the Gospel from beginning to end. Um, so at any rate, that's, that's what that first section is about. It's all about re God revealing himself to man in the person of our Lord Jesus. Uh, so we got through that section. Um... But as I said, it doesn't end with knowledge. The knowledge of a person here, or the three divine persons of the Trinity, 
it leads into a relationship. And so that, therefore, we have the second section of the catechism, which is all about the sacraments. The sacraments are about our relationship with God. And um, we won't go through in great depth, but just think about it. Baptism is the beginning of our relationship with God. It's what makes us sons and daughters of God, thus establishing a relationship. Uh, Confession um, reestablishes that relationship if we have severed it by means of mortal sin. So it's about that relationship. Uh, The Eucharist, it it is the, it's union with him. Uh, And so that is a reflection of our relationship with him. So, et cetera. Um, So the sacraments are very much about that relationship. Now, that's the second section. The third section, you know, once you enter into a relationship with somebody, uh, you have to protect that relationship. You have to do certain things and avoid doing other things. And we all know that in the relationships that we have, whether it's with our parents, our siblings, our children, our spouses, our friends, um, parishioners, there are certain rules. And as the Lord says to me, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But all these commandments, all of these rules, and you've heard me say this plenty of times, they're not rules for the sake of rules, but they're rules for the sake of protecting a relationship. So, you know, rule of spouses, uh, you remember your anniversary. You remember each other's birthday, you know, just kind of stuff like that. You remember your child's birthday. And you do something on those days. You also don't do other things like, you know, go starting relationships with others. Uh, But that is all about that relationship, protecting that relationship, which leads into the fourth section of the catechism, which is prayer, which is a reflection of our union with God. And that's what all this is heading towards. It's union with God. People struggle with that. They see the Catholic Church, oh, a bunch of rules or a bunch of fancy buildings, all all these things. It's like, just look at the very basis or basics of what we believe. It, it, It really is coming to know about Christ, establishing and maintaining a relationship with him, protecting that relationship, um, and having deeper union with him. Because guess what? In a blink of an eye, we're all going to be on our deathbeds. You know, this world will be over. <laughs> and uh, you never know when. Um, and so this life is nothing. It's a blink of the eye in comparison with the uh, eternity. So at any rate, all right, so that's that. Now, uh, can I ask you one question to kind of die, go off a little bit? On conf- you've said this before. Conf- for the Catholic, he has confession. He gets absolution for his sins through a priest who's obviously in cru- uh, persona crucial for God. For everyone else, is there I- any way for them to feel that they have been forgiven for a serious mortal sin? That's a great question. Why don't we wait until we get to confession so we can really okay. un- unpack right. the nature of the uh, forgiveness of sins? I'll remember to ask you. Yeah, no, absolutely, because <laughs> that's a very good question. Did you do something like that? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking about it. Let me go get my purple stole. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, no. All right, so, but today we're going to talk about the Eucharist, and I'm not just going to go into the first paragraph on it. You're going to understand why in, well, not eight minutes, it's going to be a few minutes. But um, there, uh, the Eucharist is the absolutely uh, the center of our faith, the source and summit of our faith. It's a lot there. It's wildly misunderstood. Only 30% of Catholics believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. That is a travesty. Only something like 60-something percent of practicing Catholics believe it. And, well, based on the way it's treated by priests who look like me, um, I, you know, I understand that. We'll get to that. Right, those, those are all, we got to do found we got to do foundation stuff now okay I want to go chronologically because uh, look New Testament ain't gonna make sense without knowledge of the Old Testament and so the Eucharist which of course was instituted at the Last Supper most people I think know that um, the Last Supper is a Passover meal 
And so we got to have an understanding of the Passover meal. Passover meal, of course, is from the book of Exodus. Some people think that's around 1,200 years before Christ. I'm in the camp that thinks it's around 1,400 years before Christ. Of course, I'm right. So we're going to go with uh, 1,400 years. We'll do our little timeline here. Uh, 1,400 B.C. So uh, the Jews have been in um, Egypt for a long time. And uh, God is going to pull them out of there. And so there are the ten plagues, of course. The tenth plague, um, and hopefully uh, COVID wasn't like the first of ten, by the way. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn son of everybody and everything. And so Egyptian, Jew, um, even the animals. And so in order to be saved from that plague, uh, God gives some prescriptions. Now, it's interesting, firstborn son. Why firstborn son? Well, the Jews were supposed to be God's firstborn son, namely a people, certain people. They were considered his firstborn of all the different races and, and ethnicities and all that. And so uh, that's probably why we're talking about the firstborn. And so God is going to save his firstborn son, uh, not only the firstborn of all the Jewish families, but also the Jews as a whole. He's going to redeem them. Red Amore to buy back. And he does so by some really weird uh, rituals. And that's, that's, uh, that's one thing right off the bat we can, we can and should consider. Namely, that God doesn't just snap his fingers. I mean, sometimes he does. You know, Christ will heal somebody uh, just by an act of his will sometimes. Other times, he is uh, spitting into the dirt and making spittle. Uh, like a little mud there and, and smearing it on people's eyes. <sighs> what? So uh, a lot of times, um, while God can work with a, a mere act of the will, a lot of times he does work through things, uh, anointing people, whether it's with spittle or uh, with the sacraments, anointing them with oil, or in the Old Testament, to take a, a little lamb, Unblemished, uh, meaning it didn't have a single broken bone. It didn't have a third eyeball. It wasn't the, the little guy you were going to throw out anyways. An unblemished, a, a good little lamb. And so each family, or if their families were very small, they could kind of bundle together, would procure a lamb. They would hang on to it for a couple weeks, get to know him, you know, maybe pet him a little part bit. Of the He's part of the family. And then... Uh, and then, bam, <laughs> um, a little guy gets sacrificed. And so the two main things, he's sacrificed and he's consumed. He's eaten. Yeah, you had to, you had to eat the lamb. And um, I've said it before. I'm sure I stole it from somebody. Um, you know, the vegans wouldn't have done too well. Uh, <laughs> vegan or vegetarian uh, Jewish families would not have done too well. Um, so at any rate, you, you sacrificed him and you consumed him. Those are two very important parts. Okay. You would take the blood and you put it on the, the, uh, the lintel and the, the doorpost and the angel of death would pass over the house. Isn't that a weird ritual? Just take a step yes. back. Weird. But he looks at the blood of course, all this is pointing towards Christ. It makes a bit more sense with Christ. But at any rate, um, they're preserved. The firstborn child would be preserved. The angel death would pass over. Okay. So that happened once a long time ago now. So in the 1400s, God acted in a very, very unique way. So let's say, you know, God is out, he is up here. That's kind of... God is outside of time. He's in eternity. Okay? But he chooses to act in a very specific way at the time of the Exodus with the first Passover. But were the Jews not commanded to observe the Passover year after year after year? Of course. They even do it uh, to today. Why? That's strange. It's like God pulled them out of Egypt then. 
It's because God wanted his people to understand in a very deep way and to participate in God's action. So this is the under so what we're getting to is the Jewish understanding of remembering. Okay? Um and in the context of the Passover. So let's just say it's a hundred years later. Okay? The Jews are keeping the Passover. The way that they understand it, the way that it was communicated to them, the way that they lived it out for millennia, was that even if they're celebrating the Passover a hundred years after the uh, Exodus, they are able to tap into something. So, all right, so if this is God and God's action it's outside of time god's outside of time but he he worked in time for the jews even if, it, if they're much later when they performed the passover they understood that as kind of tapping into god's action like the jews don't look at a, a picture of moses 100 years later and say oh yeah that happened but by performing the passover it's as if they are really there Reliving it again. They are reliving it in a very real way. It, it's sort of mystical in that sense. All right, it's at a higher level. And so this would happen, you know, year after year after year. Okay? To the time of. Just kind of make things consistent here. All right, let's just say, well, zero, even though it goes from 1 BC to 1 AD. Um, all right, and the Lord, so the Lord enters the world in zero, so they're continuing this, the, the Passover, all the way to, to 33, and so what happens in 33, the Lord is uh, entering into his passion, death, and resurrection, they're in the upper room, he has a Passover meal with the apostles, all right, so just log this part away. The Jewish understand uh, understanding of memory and remembering. We have two events that occur in uh, during the Passion, Death, and Resurrection. You have the Last Supper, and you have the Crucifixion. Those two are the same event. They are connected. It's the same action. All right, so what does the Lord do uh, at the Last Supper? He takes bread, he takes wine, he says, this is my body, which is offered for you. This is the cup of my blood, which is shed for you. That's very sacrificial language, isn't it? Yeah. Offered for you, shed for you. It became the new Passover lamb. And, and so, yeah, we're getting to that. So, um, and as uh, you are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek, and so in the book of Hebrews, it talks about how, well, is Christ a priest? Well, he's not a Levite, so he's not a priest in, in the Levitical sense. But Hebrews makes the argument he's a priest in the line of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, that goes all the way back, you know, 2,000 years before Christ to Abraham. And Abraham offers one-tenth of his goods to Melchizedek, who is the king, the priest king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. Uh, Melchizedek was a priest who offered what? Bread and wine. So a priest who offers bread and wine. Christ is a, is a priest in the line of Melchizedek. He's a priest who offers bread and wine. At the Last Supper, he offers bread and wine. But, you know, from the time of Moses to the time of the Last Supper, the Passover develops over time. Ritual it, organically. It kind of expanded. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, one of the features, was the idea of drinking uh, four cups of wine throughout this long, elaborate, ritualized meal. And I'm getting this, by the way, from uh, Scott Hahn. So, um, very, very good scripture scholar. Uh, great to listen to. Great to read. And so he has a talk called The Fourth Cup, and he makes an argument that based on the, the gospel accounts of the Last Supper, that Christ didn't end the Passover. 
um, in the normal way. Uh, there's an argument that they ended it between the third and the fourth cup. And when you would drink the fourth cup, that was the cup of consummation that, that concluded uh, the Passover. He makes the argument, they didn't get to that fourth cup. In fact, they left and they sang hymns, uh, I think Luke says. And those are, are, those are the Hillel Psalms. There are a certain group of Psalms. So Psalms, they're in the one teens. I forget the exact numbers. And so that was part of the ritual as well. You would sing Psalms, sort of like we do at Mass in between the readings. And so uh, the Lord goes from the Last Supper to where? The Garden of Gethsemane. And he says to what? He says what to his father? May, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Now it's the cup of suffering, of course, the cup of God's wrath. But um, it's also a reference, uh, perhaps, to that fourth cup. And then in John's Gospel, at the crucifixion, right before the Lord expires on the cross, he says, I thirst. And they dip a sponge uh, into vinegar or sour wine and uh, put it on the lance and put it up to his mouth, and he takes the wine. He says, consummate est. It is consummated. And so there's the argument that that is the fourth cup, that our Lord began the Passover at the Last Supper, but he wanted to connect his sacrifice with the offering of bread and wine. And so right before he expires, he takes that last cup um, on the sponge, and, and then he dies. Um, which is why, if, if we're not even considering what I just said, like, otherwise, it's just strange. If you didn't know any of that, you're just reading John's Gospel. He's like, I'm thirsty, it's consummated, and then he dies. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if he wants to connect the Last Supper, the offering of bread and wine, with his own sacrifice, it begins to make sense, okay? And what did he tell the apostles? Do this, I never even filled this out, so last supper, and then the cross, the crucifixion, these are really the same. And so he tells uh, the disciples, do the apostles, do this in remembrance of me. So in other words, remember, God is making all things new in Christ. He's the new Adam, our lady is the new Eve. We get promises of a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Uh, David's kingdom is reconstituted in the Catholic Church. Um, and we're going to get a new Passover. A Passover that looks to a slain lamb that's offered. And God acting in history at a particular point in time but through a ritualized meal, you're able to tap into that action thereafter. That's exactly what happens here. So let's have a little cross here. All right, our Lord has died. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. Now, Christ our Lord it's not, is he human or divine? We were talking about this last summer. He's human and divine. He's fully human and he's fully divine. So insofar as he's fully human, he had a body, he walked the earth 33 years, he dies in 33. He's human. So that's a specific place in time. But he's also God. He's God in the flesh. And so in a way, he's outside of time. And so what he does kind of rings eternally. So just kind of imagine the cross. These are his two natures, as human and divine. His human puts him right here in 33. But because he is like, you know, God outside of time, what he does on the cross expands through time. And so, like St. Paul will say, Abraham is justified by Christ. Wait, what? <laughs> That's 2,000 years in the future. But if Christ is God and he's outside of time, then his action on the cross extends back. So, you know, when Mel Gibson finishes making his movie on Holy Saturday and Christ is sent into hell, um, he's going to be gathering those who are justified in the Old Testament 
um, by virtue of his, his actions. And, well, let's not go into to all that, but the point is, is that his action on the cross goes to the past, but also extends uh, to the future. All right. Now, such that, when the apostles were told, do this in remembrance of me, they started offering the Mass. You know, throughout time, for 2,000 years, we've been offering the Mass. But when an apostle or a priest they would ordain or a successor bishop, um, when they would offer the Mass, just like here, Jewish understanding of remembering, do this in remembrance of me, you're tapping into this action. So it's like a bunch of little crosses. Such that when we go to Mass in 2022, and I offer Holy Mass this morning, we are participating in a very real way in what Christ did on the cross. <clears throat> By virtue of all of that stuff. All right, so let's let that sink in for a second, and then we need to, a couple more rather mind-blowing thoughts that we need to wrap into to all of this. So, let's kind of put a pause in all this for a second. Let's just consider God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before all of creation, before yeah, any need for any of this, there are three persons in the Blessed Trinity. And we're not going to go into Trinitarian theology in any depth, but let's just consider the Son. What is he doing for all eternity? He knows the Father, his knowledge of the Father, and he loves the Father. He doesn't have a body. But he loves the Father. And so I'm going to represent that. Have a body. Nobody has a body. Nobody not until the Son has uh, uh, is in his incarnation. But So the Son loves the Father. And that's represented by this little arrow. Okay. Now, when the fullness of time comes, and God chooses to send his only begotten Son into the world, he's sending... His son into the world. And so now his son has a body. You know, starting in, well, 1 AD, in the womb of Our Lady. But what is he doing? He doesn't cease, what? Loving the Father. He doesn't cease knowing the Father, giving himself to the Father. Right? This is why he goes off on his own to pray. This is why he leaves his parents, even when he's 12 years old, returns to the temple to be about his father's business. And so, again, that's represented by this, this arrow, but now he has a body. Now he's, he's bringing human nature into, this, 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 into his divine personhood, bringing his human nature into this gift to the father, knowledge of the father and gift to the father. Now, this will culminate on the cross, and so let me clean this up a little bit here so we can see it more clearly. Okay. So on the cross there, what's he doing? Giving himself to the Father in the highest form. What would the Lord say? There's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. So God who is love, God who's totally consumed by the other, the Son knowing and loving the Father, not concerned about himself and how the Father makes him feel, but his giving of himself to the Father, that's the true nature of love, self-gift, and that's manifested supremely on the cross. You know, two young lovebirds can have all sorts of strong feelings for each other, not imagine life apart from each other, but is that love really stronger than when, you know, one spouse, uh, you know, can't even uh, clean up after themselves, you know, and that the other really has to deny themselves in service 
and love, you know, how does that love compare, you know, when you don't feel like doing it? So, um, so that's what Christ is doing for all eternity. He brings into his life here. Now, here's the other point, is that our Lord saw himself as the head. So why don't we just kind of move this out for a second. He's the head of the body that is the church. And so by virtue of our faith and baptism, uh, when we are united to Christ, you know, we become members of his, of his body. So we kind of see that as the church. Maybe you're a, a pinky and I'm a toe. Who knows? But uh, we're all members of, of his body. And guess what? I mean, do you see your head and your body as two separate things? I mean, I don't. We're, anim by, we're animated by the same soul. We have one soul that animates head and body, that unites our head and our body and makes everything work in conjunction. Um, and so that's the Holy Spirit in this case. By virtue of the Holy Spirit, the descent of the Holy Spirit, which is the birth of the church, right? Um, unites us with Christ. So, such that as we have one soul to govern our, our head and our body and all of our, our fingers, so Christ, um, he's driven by the Spirit. You see that in, in Scripture. But he's united with his body by that same Spirit. Okay? So he's the head, we're the body, we have one Spirit, one soul, that is the Holy Spirit. So, if Christ himself is offering, if Christ is offering himself, rather, to the Father, that should be what we are doing. That is the action. We offer ourselves to God. We don't just have nice feelings about nice religiously type thingies. But at the end of the day, our job as Christians is in union with Christ to offer ourselves to the Father. Now, this is where the Mass comes into play. That when, like this morning, Holy Mass is offered and the sacrifice of our Lord is represented on the altar this morning at this church, a couple thousand years after the crucifixion, a couple thousand miles away from where it occurred, Christ comes down and offers himself Again, that one eternal offering. And we are invited to join in that offering. We too are offering ourselves. Man, that was ugly. <laughs> so, what is our job at Mass? It is to offer ourselves a self gift to the father in union with Christ whose sacrifice is represented on our altar and we do that by virtue of the Holy Spirit see how the whole Trinity is at work here that is the purpose of the mass and I'm going to say this not to, to pick on anybody uh, but to to stress, it's going to help us understand the mat, what the Mass is, what the Eucharist is better, by understanding how other Christians understand uh, how they worship. So, Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, we believe the exact same thing in this stuff. All right? The Eastern Orthodox, the Greeks, the Russians, uh, the Chaldeans, all of them. They all have valid bishops, valid priests, valid Masses. They understand the Mass like this. Because guess what? They go back to the first century like we do. Well, a lot of the Eastern uh, Orthodox churches do. Uh, go back to the first century. Uh, not all of them, but a number of them do. And so we all have the same faith. This is what the apostles believed. This is what they taught. And so we simply all did the same thing. Okay? And to this day. Uh, so, at any rate. Uh, but what I'm talking about are other Christians. So, mostly Protestants. And again, I'm not saying that... I'm not disparaging them um, or saying that uh, what they do is dumb or, or, or meaningless or that their moms are ugly, okay? I'm not saying any of that. But I, uh, are there some things that uh, 
we have in common? Yes. But this is one of those things that we are worlds apart. Okay? So what would be a, a, a typical Protestant service? Um, first of all, the vast majority of them do not believe in any of this. The vast, vast, vast majority do not believe in any of this. They don't think we have access to the, the sacrifice of Christ sacramentally. They think Christ died in the year 33. That's it. That's done. Just believe in him. Um, and again, I'm not trying to oversimplify or, or whatever. But at their service, what is the heart of their service? It's a, it's a, it's a sermon or a homily. And usually they go a lot longer because that's what they have. And look, I mean, I, best of intentions. Uh, you know, the, the pastor is trying to break open scripture for, uh, for his people. All right, that's not a bad thing. Scripture study, scripture uh, uh, investigation of scripture, that's not a bad thing. You can come to know the, the person of Christ, at least intellectually. So I'm not disparaging that. They also sing hymns. Hymns are fine. They pray for people and for events and things. That's fine. They support each other. They have fellowship. That's fine. In fact, these, all these things are good. But they don't have, and they don't claim to have, a priest who is able to renew the one eternal sacrifice of Christ. They don't claim to be able to be there at the foot of the cross mystically next to Our Lady and, and St. John. And their idea of worship, uh, you know, it's a lifting up the mind and the heart to God, praising God. And that, that's fine. That's good. But it comes nowhere close to being able to unite yourself as Our Lady and St. John did at the foot of the cross. See, what they did 2,000 years ago, that's what we are called to do today, because guess what? The sacrifice of our Lord is made present again. And so Our Lady, who perfectly personifies the church, she stood at the foot of the cross. And you know, Gibson's movie made it, I mean, he, he beautifully portrayed Our Lady's perfect participation of the cross when the Lord is being raised up, they're, they're lifting up the cross. Our Lady, who has been very distraught and tearful, you know, kneeling down, she's grabbing onto rocks as they're nailing her son. And then he's lifted up. And she stands as he's being lifted up. And she lets go of those rocks. Which artistically, beautifully portrayed her perfect participation. You know, does she want her son to suffer like that? No. Did she know that he was called to be offered as a sacrifice for our sins? Yes. And so she lets go and she offers her son to God. And so we, in a sacramental way, that's what we do. And we offer ourselves with him. All right, so maybe that explains why I don't walk into mass happy clappy. Good morning, y'all. You know, because all this stuff is, is taking place. It's a very, very solemn thing. And it drives me crazy when priests treat it with such lightheartedness. No it's like, do you not know what you're doing? So again, that's kind of tapping into something else. But, you know, let me just give you a sneak preview of, I think we will have to talk about, and I, we went into it some last summer, Thanks to recent uh, unpleasant uh, Vatican documents regarding the, the old traditional mass. But, um, you know, we will talk some about, well, the reforms and what they were motivated by. And the chief thing that they were motivated by, and this isn't the, 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 the Vatican II, this was a small group of people who hijacked the reform. And I'm using that word uh, on purpose. And when you read Archbishop Bignini, who was in charge of all of this, he even wrote it, uh, or said it in an interview, I forget which. He said, our primary duty was to remove any obstacles for the Protestants. In other words, his goal was to Protestantize the Mass. 
and and we'll give him the best of intentions. He's trying to foster Christian unity. All right, Christians should be one. That's a good intention. But ironically, he sacrificed the sacrifice of the mass in trying to do that. Not literally, but a lot of the symbolisms, a lot of the rituals um, got stripped. Any reference to sacrifice get, got stripped away in the reform so that it would look more Protestant, so that hopefully we would join with them. But in the process of that, guess what? The Protestants reject sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice of the mass that is, and they reject the Lord's real presence in the Eucharist. And are we really shocked that only 30% of Catholics believe in the Lord's real presence in the Eucharist when for the last, whatever it is, 50 years now, uh, you know, it's essentially been a Protestantized form of the mass and their services do not believe in the real uh, presence. All right, so I'll, I'll stop. Well, maybe we'll, we'll get into that, uh, that later. I don't want to get into the polemics now, but it, it is helpful to understand what the Mass is. It's precisely when you see it rejected or challenged or, in this case, Protestantized. Um, and again, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's, uh, they, they said it. That was the goal. So, All right, I'm trying to think. Uh, Father, when you say that we, we are joining with Jesus in the renewal of his sacrifice and we're offering ourselves up at the same time and I think one time in the last couple of weeks because of the murders in Texas you said offer up ourselves uh, for the benefit of those people that were impacted you know like in the Ukraine or in that Texas massacre that's what you should be doing each time you go up to the altar to receive communion Mm -hmm. is offering yourself up and maybe even for the benefit of someone else. Mm -hmm. is, is that... Well, by virtue of that, we are... Well, hum humanity is united by virtue of its shared nature. We all have a human nature, and we can, um, uh, we can assist each other. But, yeah, we're all in this uh, together. And by bringing... You know, the, the cross, the Lord's sacrifice, is the source of all graces, Every ounce of grace that's ever been given, ever will be given, flows from the cross. And so if we're able to bring our petitions to the cross, in addition to we offer ourselves, yes, but we also bring our petitions. If we offer mass for somebody, um, whether officially and having a mass, a mass offered for them, or just all this, you know, if there are 100 people at mass, you can have 100 different people bringing all the petitions that they want, bringing them to the foot of the altar, whence the source of all grace uh, flows. So, all right, now let me, let me read for you the, the first uh, paragraph where we, where we left off last summer. And maybe you're going to understand why I didn't just, Which like, uh, this is 271, um, page 81, if you have the book. You, maybe you'll understand why I didn't just uh, read at you this paragraph. Because, anyway, just have a listen. The Eucharist is the very sacrifice of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, which he instituted to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until his return in glory. All right, how could you just read that one sentence without any of that background and say, oh yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, so anyway, that's why I chose to go this route. Thus he entrusted to his church this memorial of his death and resurrection. It is a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and the pledge of future glory is given to us. All right, so mention the paschal banquet. Uh, is there an element of a meal to Mass? There is an element. I mean, it's rooted in the, the Passover. It's rooted in the Last Supper. And, um, you know, some people uh, would make the argument then, well, we've got to make it look like a meal again. The problem is, is that during the Apostolic period, that is, while the Apostles were still alive, and the last one, John, dies around the year 100, so this is the apostolic period. Um, um, it becomes very much like a sacrifice. 
by the close of the apostolic age. All right, so it's really sort of uh, uh, cocooned into, or kind of, uh, kind of morphed into, not not without not shedding its root as a as the Last Supper, as a Passover meal, but during the apostolic period, it becomes much more of a sacrifice. And I can feel very confident in saying that because, you know, we have the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who dies just seven years after the apostolic period, in the year 107. And his letters sound a lot like the holy sacrifice of the Mass. There's an altar. There's a sacrifice. Um, he's not talking about it as if it were a meal. Um, so at any rate, so we're pretty confident on that. So during the just like during the apostolic period, um, the apostles created the um, not created, but they they unpacked the priesthood into uh, bishop, uh, priest, and deacon. All right. Did Christ do that uh, during his public his three years of public ministry? No, but the apostles did because uh, they, um, as the Lord promised, they were to receive the Holy Spirit. And so you even read about deacons being created in Acts of the Apostles. So at any rate, um, so what happens at this first period is very, very important. So point is, we don't go and try to imitate the Last Supper and sit around a table um, and make it look like a, a Passover meal. No, there was true development, okay? Because it's connected to the cross. So it is a sacrifice. All right. So... Good. Uh, any questions on that? It's it's kind of that's a lot, um, a lot of foundation stuff. Uh, it's not a question, but a comment, and you really helped me understand. You know, after my thirty-something years in, in the evangelical world, um, the biggest um, objection to the mass, I would say, is people will say, "Well, that you know, his his life is his." was once for all. So with your continuum there of eternality, saying, you know, and that and that whole is it I, I always remember is it anamnesis or something? There's some term. Yeah. That that's is, memory. Is yeah, that the Greek memory. version of the yeah. And so and so it is the, the Protestant objection usually is you're trying to re sacrifice but mm -hmm. your point there is so well drawn is that we are entering into the thing that has happened, you know, is happening. It's it's eternal, and it's no wonder it's hard for man to understand. It's this. a lot. This is a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's what that's how the Jews understood it. Absolutely. It's so easy to to talk to Jews about the mass because like this is what they firmly understand. So, yeah, I mean, that would be my question to uh, an evangelical or somebody like that. It's like, um, well, you have all this kind of reference to Jewish Passover stuff, and this is how it operated. It wasn't like God kept coming into the world at every Passover, like in that sense, you know, as they would accuse us of re-sacrificing Christ. So, no, it, it's very Jewish. Um, That's right, it is very Jewish. Yeah, right. Sacrifice, you know, reenact. Yeah, no, that's that's a very important uh, question. Does 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 the Lord suffer at each mass? With it? No, and that's an important distinction that the Lord's uh, sacrifice is renewed, um, but in an unbloody manner. An unbloody manner. So, is he suffering uh, right now? Uh, only through his members. You know, as you know, people are, are suffering in that sense, he suffers. But you know, when we offer mass, you know, it's not like I have a hammer in my hands, you know. And so, um, actually, this is a helpful image from the book of the Apocalypse, uh, Revelation, whatever. Um, John has an image of heaven, and what does he see? He sees a lamb standing, looking as if slain. That's at the center of heaven. This image of a, of, a, of a slain lamb, yet he's standing. And so, um, you know, what is Christ doing for all eternity? Maybe to go back to our um, Trinitarian image here. You know, even before his incarnation, he was loving the Father. 
And then when he, uh, when he returns, like at the ascension, he now has a body with the, uh, the, the, the marks of the crucifixion in his hands and his side and his feet. And what is he doing for, for eternity now? What's he doing in heaven? It's as if, if you were to use that image from the book of the Apocalypse, uh, he's standing, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, is standing, looking as if slain. He still bears the marks of the crucifixion. He's no longer suffering, but he still bears those marks. And it's as if he's showing his Father in a sort of a continual of that self-gift, but now he brings the marks of his crucifixion. Uh, he, he's presenting these marks to his Father for all eternity. And again, how time works, that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult, and that's another topic. Um, but... So in an unbloody and in a painless manner, Christ continues to offer himself in heaven to the Father, making continual intercession for us, as the book of Hebrews says. Um, and so that unbloody manner is reflected also on our altars. Um, I'm having trouble with the Uh, because that was revealed. Uh, Moses was told, this is what will happen. And, yeah, it's a strange ritual. You know, I mean, it kind of looks like the cross. You know, doorposts and lentils and blood being smeared. So they're going from the Old Testament. And that's what st and then to come to. Okay. And, um... Yeah, well, he, he was told this is what you got to tell the Jews to do. Okay. Um, oh, and I, I forgot to make the other point about um, they had to sacrifice the lamb, but they also had to eat the lamb. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, maybe we'll talk more about this uh, uh, next time. But that's why our Lord says in John 6, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have life in you. Otherwise, why would he say that? Yeah. It just sounds weird. Well, the evangelical will say, well, it's like you got to eat his word and consume his word, you know, the Bible. Like, that's how they understand it. Like, well, no, no. It makes a lot more sense in this context. Because, in, like, in John's gospel, um, our Lord is portrayed, like, the whole crucifixion scene is very, very much portrayed like a Passover. Our Lord is wearing a seamless garment, the same uh, type of garment that the high priest would wear. Uh, not a bone of his was broken. Remember, they broke the, the legs of the two thieves in order to hasten their death so that they could bury them before the sun went down, which was the beginning of the Sabbath. And they went to break the Lord's legs, but he was already dead. And as John adds, not a, uh, and as it is written, not a bone of his will be broken. That harkens back to the little lamb. What did I say? You can't have a little lamb with a broken bone or a third eyeball. Okay, it's got to be unblemished. And so, at any rate, uh, our Lord is being sacrificed at the same time the, the lambs are being sacrificed in John's gospel. Um, he's the Lamb of God in, in John's gospel. Uh, lamb is a big, big uh, idea throughout John's uh, book of Revelation. That's the primary title of the Lord. All right? And so, in order to apply the sacrifice to you, you had to eat, the, you had to eat part of the sacrifice. All right. But we'll talk more about that next time because I, I didn't get into it in Highlands. I want to make sure we're, we're in sync. Mm -hmm. One more question about the Last Supper. You know, in the, diff in the four different Gospels, um, I think only one of them says that they actually, like there's an account of them actually eating the lamb. They did eat the Passover. You know, is that, or is, did they just eat yeah. the Last Supper? It's not mentioned. I don't think the lamb is mentioned in any yeah. Uh, they just said they were doing the Passover yeah. meal. So you assume because, they did everything they were supposed to yeah. except for the fourth cup. Yeah, but the Lord himself is the lamb. I think that's, that's the idea. So, very good. Uh, anything else? Uh, like right. this illumination thing. Yeah, so it, it's very foundational and, and we'll build on that. So, okay. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, the Lord be with you.
Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, of her Virgin, all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.